70% of um, the 1% wealthiest in our country are men with traditional family structure. Women, are, you know, so many times say, well, I have to do X, Y, and Z because my partner makes more money than I do. And we, it's, you know, again, this is Eve Verodsky, who I love in her book, Fair Play. She calls it a toxic time message. <laughs> Hey guys, thanks for tuning into this episode of Mom Talks with Krista. I'm your host, Krista. And man, I am so pumped after today's interview. I spoke with Erin from Totem Women and it was just such a cool interview. Erin is so passionate about what she does and Totem Women, if you haven't heard of it, they are mom's advocate. They're doing everything to help moms in everyday life from being from sharing education, to workforce and they work with companies and women to make things better for women after having babies. Man, she talks so much that I'm just I'm so excited just to share this episode with you guys. So yeah, we got a great episode for you guys. I just want you guys to uh, listen with an open mind. And at the end, she talks about ways you can get involved, share with your friends and be a part of this amazing platform that she has created for all women. So check it out. And at the very end, don't miss our new segment called Mom Tales of the Week. We are posting them to Instagram and Facebook, and it gives you guys an opportunity to share your Mom Tales of the Week, share different um, stories. We have different questions that we'll ask every week that kind of prompts you to share something with us. So we're going to share some of our favorites at the end of the episode. So stick around and enjoy this amazing episode with Erin from Totem Women. Welcome, Erin. Thanks for coming today. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here with you. Yeah, I'm so excited. So for anyone who doesn't know, can you just tell us first a little bit about you and we'll kind of go from there? I'm a mom of three. I have a nine-year-old, a six-year-old, and a three-year-old boy, girl, boy. I'm also an attorney. I'm originally from a very small town. And then from there, I have lived a lot of different places, traveled a lot. I've done a lot of different things, worn a lot of hats in terms of my career and my work history. I've done everything from work in music law to run a nonprofit in the music industry to working in tech in tech and entertainment worked as an agent for a while in LA and then but there's always been this thread of two things really social impact like progress and change and being very driven toward autonomy, wanting to work in an entrepreneurial way. So I founded Totem Women, Totem means whole in Latin, and that's very intentional um, because my experience when I became a mother in 2012, I was a little bit on the older side. I was 34 when I had our first baby, and I was not the kind of woman who had grown up playing with baby dolls or even babysat. I think I babysat maybe twice or had um, an idea or a plan around when I was going to have kids. I was really career driven. Mm -hmm. And when I got married to my husband, who's a veterinarian, by the way, which is sort of a fun fact, we got pregnant. I got pregnant really quickly, right, right after we got married. And so I had this experience of new motherhood that absolutely shocked me in a wonderful way because I really loved being a mother. And I encountered this woman inside of me that I hadn't met before. I found that I had these sides that were really um, soft and loving and patient and slow and kind. And I think because I had been so career driven for so long, I had taken in this message that I had to be, you know, direct and focused and high achiever. And that's an exhausting way to live. And so I've always sort of had this fraught relationship with my ambition, but then when I became a mother, I was really shocked at the revolution that had just happened in my body, like how much things changed overnight and how, frankly, how long it took to heal from childbirth. And no one was talking about that, especially then my mind, you know, I was thinking differently about everything. My ambition, as I just mentioned, I mean, I had a really big job at the time and I was expected to go right back to that. And I didn't want to, and I didn't know what to make of that. I felt sort of like a bad feminist because this was the time of lean in. That was like the zeitgeist at the time. It was lean in. And I just want to sit down. I was exhausted and really enjoying 
being able to breastfeed my baby and relax and be attuned and connected to his needs. And I didn't know how that was going to work when I went back to work in this environment that expected so much. So body, mind, ambition, and relationships, my relationships changed overnight too. You know, with everybody, I think that happens to every mother. We see our own parents differently. We see our partner differently, our friendships, all of it changes. We need a new group of friends who uh, really understand what we're going through. So I had this big experience and I was just shocked that it seemed like the world expected me to be fine, like business as usual. I was also shocked going to baby group and seeing how we weren't really open about what our actual experience was. And I just felt like women deserve more. Women deserve to be whole. That I kept feeling really discombobulated and really like, it's like Humpty Dumpty, like all these different pieces of me, like the, the me that I was before I had kids and like, what's the future me and what's going on with my body. I just felt like women deserve to be whole. And I don't know what I'm going to create now but I am going to eventually make my life about this. So that was 2012. And in 2018, I started Totem. Wow. That's amazing. I love that story of just kind of, as you were kind of brought into motherhood, you kind of realized like, okay, there's a lot that is not presented at first. And I think you bring up a good point about how a lot of times women have to choose or are told by society, like choose career or kids. And then once, if you do finally choose kids, then you have to go back to your career like nothing happened. Um, So you bring up amazing points about how, you know, how can women, you know, show that they can be both, but also be real about their experiences in both aspects. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that's difficult and an idea that I'm pretty obsessed with at the moment is that it's particularly difficult in the US because we don't value care. And that's not something I say just as a something I think. There's data around that, you know, and globally, even there's $10.9 trillion of unpaid, invisible work on the shoulders of women and girls. And 70% of the top 1% of financially, quote unquote, successful people in this country are men with a traditional family structure, meaning there's a wife at home who is handling care, handling everything with the kids, all the the mental load and invisible labor of what it means to run a household and look after vulnerable lives and people who are growing. And we saw that, especially during the pandemic, as you you hear people talk about it as a she session, you know, all these women who were pushed out of the workforce. And, you know, Eve Rodsky is a heroine of mine and has also become a great friend. And what she says, which is, I think, a really edgy way to put it, is that no woman really chooses to leave their career. It's that our careers are not set up for us to be able to care in the way that we would like to, and to continue in a career that we find fulfilling. These, it's really a dichotomy that's set up in competition with one another. Industry and care really don't play well together. That's an awesome quote. I've never quite heard that. Interesting. Makes you think. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Because we are a lot of times made, like we were just saying, made to choose. And, you know, and I think, the women that you said, exactly. They leave the workforce, but not necessarily because they want to. It's because there's something that's not working. It's not, they're not able to balance or they're not able to get their passion from that job. Yeah, I think that's, that's an amazing thing to talk about. So how has Totem evolved over the years. So you said in 2018 is when you when you started Totem. And so how did it kind of start? And then where are you kind of, where's the direction kind of going now? Yeah, thanks for that question because it has evolved a lot. So I know this is near and near dear to your hearts. We started out with a lactation product. And the reason for that is simply it was the first thing that I made for myself that solved a problem that I was able to deliver to other women. That's really the thesis and what keeps me going with Totem. Like when I solve a problem for myself, I want to then repeat that at scale to help as many women as possible. So one of the things that came up for me when I headed right back to work was that I actually 
feel really fortunate that I had a wonderful breastfeeding experience. I, you know, wasn't without its difficulties. I certainly had to learn what latch was like and the baby's mouth had to be like really wide open, all these things that were not taught that just, it's hard to kind of fumble through. However, you know, and I'll just to be honest, I have these really small boobs. I've always had small boobs and they were like the little engine that could, like when I needed to produce milk, they were fantastic. And I had this wonderful nursing relationship with our baby, George. And I actually ended up having that with uh, all three of our kids. And I loved it. I loved the time sitting down, rocking him, nursing him, looking at his little face, feeling his soft skin, just seeing the purity and just the cleanliness of, of his experience and all of our experiences when we come into earth. It was something I hadn't thought about much before. And it was just so beautiful and nourishing for both of us. And, you know, I went back to work and it was, I was unprepared for what it would be like to leave my baby and then rely on pumping instead of nursing to feed him. So that very first day, I mean, I, I worked at a company called Indiegogo and everybody, by the way, working there at best of intentions, it was just, it went from this startup of like five people, I think it was like the third or fourth employee there to, we raised a series A and a series B and it had hundreds of employees by the time I went back to work mm -hmm. and I was part of building that success. And so I went back and we were still working like a scrappy startup. And here I am used to feeding my baby between I really fed on demand because I enjoyed that. And so it was like every 45 minutes or every two hours. And then at work, I was just like, whoa, how do I make this work? I, I was the first mother there. I was the second parent, mm -hmm. but the, the first parent was a dad. And so I didn't feel comfortable asking him like, how do I carve out time to breastfeed and where do I breastfeed? And like, I felt awkward about cleaning my pump. I really had no clue. And so what happens as you know, if you're not keeping up with a regular nursing or pumping schedule, our body, it's all supply and demand. So without regular expression, your body gets the memo. Okay. I guess we don't need to make this much milk anymore. And then there's also this thing that happens where you're devoting your brain power and your energy to something work-related rather than being flesh to flesh with your baby. And in that, like I keep saying that kind of like slow mode add to that, I felt an enormous amount of pressure to perform. And so I wasn't stopping to eat as regularly as I had been at home. So all of that was going on and I kept craving a cookie. I was like, Ugh, I just, I don't normally have a sweet tooth, but when I was breastfeeding, I had a raging sweet tooth. And I kept thinking, I just really want a cookie that tastes like something my grandma would make to me for me if I was like having a bad day and I want it to be really nourishing and nutrient dense and I want it to help me make breast milk. And I would like look around for the perfect cookie. And there was really only one that was big on the market then. And it just wasn't for me. It was dry and crumbly. And I wanted like this soft mouth feel cookie. Mm -hmm. Well, turned out our company headquarters, I was in LA at the time, our company headquarters was in San Francisco. And I would stay with my husband's uncle and his husband. And my, my husband's uncle, Robert had been a COO at Mrs. Fields. So I said to him, I like keep craving this amazing lactation cookie because I'd researched lactation cookies and lactation foods at that point. And he was like, I don't know anything about lactation. He's like, you know, 60 year old married gay man. He's like, I don't know lactation, but I know how to make an amazing cookie because I work for Mrs. Fields. So together we created this recipe and these cookies were fantastic. I mean, it was like a dark, dark chocolate, big dark chocolate chips and lots of rolled oats and uh, pistachios and pine nuts and almond butter, all these really, really nutrient dense ingredients, mm -hmm. along with the galactagogues that help you increase breast milk. So I was making them for myself all the time. I would freeze like a big roll of them and just cut them up and make them all the time. And I was giving them then to new moms. I took them to my baby group and anytime a neighbor had a baby or a friend had a baby, I would make them these cookies. And so of course, everybody's saying to me, like, you need to, this needs to be a business. You need to start a lactation cookie business. And while I was flattered 
it didn't quite land for me. And the reason with, you know, the benefit of some time now is that my passion was never baking. I'm not somebody who was like, I just like love to bake. I love to bake. And I wanted, I was more interested with the broad mission of helping modern mothers be whole mm-hmm. than I was sinking into the production and logistics of getting a cookie to market. That having been said, I did it because it was the first, like I said, the first thing that, you know, problem I'd solved for myself that other mothers, I mean, not only do they love the taste, they were like really Per, these these cookies really performed well. I mean, I our HR manager at a company that I worked at later was like, oh my God, I was eking out an ounce and now I've got like four ounces on each side. These things are no joke. They really performed. And so um, I was making them. I started out working with a baker in Los Angeles who's also a mom. She's like former Google turned baker. Mm-hmm. And so we were making these and we were really successful with them. We got into Erewhon, which is a... a well-known, like hard to get into specialty foods, uh, grocer in Los Angeles. We got into air one right away. We were featured in goo and it was really taking off, but I was noticing that for me, in terms of being the founder of this company and where I wanted to put my time, because I now had three kids. What I loved most was the events where we would, I would sit around with other experts in the motherhood space, like pelvic floor experts, doulas, um, maternal mental health, therapist. And I just loved listening to moms, just hearing other moms experiences and then convening for them experts who could help them navigate and feel less alone. That to me was the juicy piece. And so I just noticed that we did keep going with the cookies. I turned them into a mix because it was easier from a shelf life standpoint and a shipping standpoint and a cost perspective. So funny enough, we launched the mix right at the beginning of 2020, and I sunk a lot of personal funds into that. It was just expensive to bring a product to market. We were working with a co-packer. And then the pandemic hit, and then our son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes completely out of nowhere the day after Mother's Day 2020. So my life was really turned upside down, and I consider the pandemic to be a collective trauma, something that we all went through as a trauma. And then I had this personal trauma. My whole family did. We don't have a history of type one. So it's not something that was ever on our radar. And frankly, I had no knowledge of how it even worked. Mm -hmm. And, you know, type one is an autoimmune condition. It's not based on how you're living your life. So it wasn't like, you know, I I could look at his lifestyle and say, oh, you're heading down a path of X, Y, Z. So a long story ended up in the hospital for three days with our, at the time, seven and a half year old son. And it was just him and me because it was the height of COVID. So my husband couldn't be there. Family couldn't be there. And it really turned my life on its ear. And I had, came out of that experience and had to really take a hard look at what I had built with Totem because it's really myself and then some contract employees. And I was working really, really hard driven by a mission And I had to really look at it and say, okay, my time is really valuable. I'm really devoted to care for this family. My family needs me and I need them. What, how am I most useful? If my, the problem I'm looking to solve is to help modern mothers be whole. And that's never changed for me, by the way, Krista, like that's always been it for me. What can I do that where I can have a reliable impact with less spend of my time and and really look at like what unique experience or gifts do I bring to this industry, so to speak, because now it's very different from 2012. There are a lot of amazing women who are leading motherhood communities and, you know, have products that aren't just for baby, but they're for moms too, you know, you all included. And so I had to look at what do I bring to this? That's, that's really my own, you know? And so I looked at the fact that I've worked in uh, inside companies as a leader and an executive for two decades. I'm an attorney, and I decided that I needed to really focus on maternal rights advocacy. And so that looked like 
selling out of the cookies. We just sold out of the last run and decided we were going to pause production and consider whether, you know, there's another company that wants to buy the recipe, you know, and when that happens, that's great. I would like to get these back into the world because they work so well. But frankly, I have really focused my efforts on working with companies who want to support their working parents and doing legal work again, especially for female founders who are moms who need help with employment or business related strategic work. And so I really have rejiggered things and we launched the website Totem Work that focuses more on where we're going. We did also launch a series called Totem Talks during the pandemic where we bring experts into the homes of women who are looking for support. So that's been great. But Um, And now we are really focused on helping save federal paid leave. So it's, it's been quite a transition, but I'm really grateful to have my own company where I can just decide to move in this way. I love that. I think, cause I think so many times we think once we go a certain direction, we have to like stick that way, but I think pivots are like what make us eventually find like where our passion lies. And that's where we, where we belong. So I love that journey that you kind of took and like kind of figured out like, okay, this is where I belong and this is where I'm, you know, most useful to people. So absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's awesome. And so we kind of, you kind of brought up the federal leave. So I want to talk more about that too, because I know there's a lot that's been going on with it right now. And so what kind of awareness are you bringing to it? And for those that don't know, what's kind of going on with the discussion around federal leave right now? So President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris initially put forward an initiative that was the American Families Plan or the American Rescue Plan. This has gone under so many different names. And one of the most exciting pieces of that initiative was federal paid leave. And it's really a beautifully written initiative. It's incredibly inclusive. It includes all genders. It includes more than leave to take care of a child. It includes both uh, parents who have given birth and adoptive parents. It includes caretaking for any loved one that you might have in your family that you want to you want to care for. It includes victims of domestic violence who need time away from work to recover. It's just a beautifully written initiative. So. I was contacted by Paid Leave US, who's one of the main lobby groups who is working for federal paid leave and has been working for federal paid leave for years. And I, one of the women on that team, Jordan Avila, I used to work with at Omaze, which is where I worked before Totem. And I love her and we've stayed in touch. And so when I found out about what she was doing and told her that I was really focused on advocacy, I had done my research around, you know, what it takes to be a successful advocate. And one of the big things is you don't want to reinvent the wheel. You don't, the worst thing you can do is make it about ego and say, well, this needs to be the totem women initiative to save paid leave. You got to look at who's been working on this for a while and has traction and has a strategy and then hook your wagon to them and figure out how you can help. And so, so I really connected with them early in the year. What's happened with this initiative is that it started out on its own. Then it was consumed by the infrastructure initiative. So under the thesis of well, care is family infrastructure. And so let's wrap this all into infrastructure. But then, and I think, you know, from what I've learned, one of the part of kind of the death knell of this initiative was that it also was consumed by budget reconciliation. So you can imagine Congress is looking at, we've got a lot of stuff to pay for. And we just went through this really intense time with the pandemic, so much going on with the economy. So there's this huge initiative to look at. And then on top of that, of course, you've got political interests. And so it looked like federal paid leave was going to pass. And it was 12 weeks of federal paid leave. And you talk to most moms and they say, well, 12 weeks isn't enough. However, there are currently nine states that offer 12 weeks of of paid leave um, that's, you know, paid by the state. And so that's that's the minimum that these states are offering. And so it's a good working model, right? It's like, so let's get to, let's start at a place that seems 
tenable and we can see some precedent for how this has been done by some states. So it started out at 12 weeks and then it got whacked to four weeks. And you started hearing women be really angered by that. And what part of the reason is that when you're a new mother, so even though this, this initiative includes so many other people and different kinds of care, let's just talk about moms. When you've given birth, what most people didn't know, I certainly had no clue until I gave birth. You bleed for around six weeks. I mean, you're still bleeding. Like four weeks in, you're certainly still leaking breast milk. Most times you're bleeding, you're recovering in your body. So we at Totem started this hashtag, build back bleeding, as in we can't build back bleeding because this initiative got built into, I've got to say the build back better program. And so we just started to say, moms can't build back bleeding. And I think it's such a moment because a lot of what a woman goes through, starting with her period, you know, it's a lot to go through in our bodies and nobody wants to see it. Nobody wants to talk about it. It seems like icky or inconvenient or not pretty. And so we hide these things from the time that we are young girls or like hiding our tampons or hiding our pads or not wanting our friends to find out that we were the first one to get our period. And we know so little about it. Well, then there again, we become moms. And I mean, I don't know about other moms, but I was completely shocked what had happened in my body. I was so prepared for childbirth. I took all these Bradley birth classes and had an um, unmedicated vaginal birth. And so I thought that I, you know, had done everything I needed to do in my recovery. It was just going to be like lickety split. No, it was intense. I remember telling my mom, like asking her to please go down and look at my vagina because I was afraid it was quote unquote two flapping wings. I was like, I don't even know. Like what is happening? <laughs> and she was so sweet. My mom was like, no, it's beautiful. You're fine. You just got a very, very big bruise. And so without getting too, too much TMI, although I've already done so much, she and my husband, who's a veterinarian, really figured out what was happening for me and helped me care for myself. But you know, my doctor was like, see in six weeks. Mm -hmm. So I think every mom has her story about what was going on for her four weeks postpartum. So what we've seen, you know, in the totem community, I started posting about this last week and our numbers and our engagement, like really went up like a hockey stick. Mm -hmm. And so I realized this is something that women are hungry for information on. They want to understand where does this initiative sit? What can we do to help make sure that this gets passed? And I want to tell my story. You know, what happened to just finish up on kind of like where we are. So we lost federal paid leave entirely. And then there was a lot of fighting to bring it back. Nancy Pelosi really um, pushed that. And lobby groups like Paid Leave US were really behind that too and were really strategic. They had some rallies, rally in San Francisco, in New York and DC. And Paid Leave is back in the Build Back Better initiative, which is awesome but it's back, it's still at four weeks. And so we still have work to do. The delightful gift in all of this is that so many of us who run motherhood communities, so Blessing of Mother Honestly, Alexis of Not Safe From Mom group, Lauren Smith Brody of the fifth trimester, Daphne Delvo of the mom attorney, and on and on and on. We have all come together to form an alliance around this. And we're gonna be rolling out something on social media within the next couple of days where every mother everywhere can get involved in a very specific way that uses her gifts and her interest to do something to save paid leave. And then in the future to advocate on behalf of mothers. So that's been the gift in all of this. Wow. That's amazing. I love like the passion and goals behind everything you're doing. Cause that was going to be my next question too, is how can women that are listening, get involved and spread the word or, you know, just create awareness of everything going on. So, now. I mean, I would say for now, follow at totem women on Instagram. That's where we're talking about this the most, you know, in feed posts and on stories. And we're also pointing you um, in the right direction of where you can help and also follow paid leave us. It's there's a little plus sign in between it um, at Paid Leave US. And they are really doing amazing work. So you can donate to them, but also be, I'm like so tempted to tell you what we're doing right now, but I have to respect our timing with our partners. 
be just pay attention on Instagram on totem. Um, we are going to be rolling out something with a lot of other motherhood community leaders where you can specifically join up and get involved and be a part of this movement. Awesome. And yeah, and by the time this episode comes out, it might already be out. So definitely check yeah. out their page because it yeah. probably will already be posted by that point. We'll see. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, this, I mean, this has been such an awesome, I think important episode. I love just hearing about the journey of where you guys are now and kind of how you've evolved over the years. And I just get so like pumped up when I talk to super passionate people and I can just like feel it through the screen, like when I talk to you. So I think it's really cool. All the work you're doing. That's amazing. Thank you, Krista. Yeah, I am fired up. Sometimes I wish I were less fired up. I'm also tired, like every mom under the sun, but I'm so fired up about it. That's amazing. So I always like to um, end these interviews with a fun thinking question, I call it. So if you could have one billboard made today where you could share one tip with moms everywhere, what would you have it say? Time is not money. Your time is your time. I love that. And the reason for that is we buy into this idea that time is money and it really shoots us in the foot all the time because we are living in a world where there's still a very big wage gap. And so, and, you know, back to the stat of 70% of um, the 1% wealthiest in our country are men with traditional family structure. Women, you know, so many times say, well, I have to do X, Y, and Z because my partner makes more money than I do. And we, it's, you know, again, this is Eve Rodsky, who I love in her book, Fair Play. She calls it a toxic time message. And I think when we shatter this notion that time is money, we will start to remember that what we care about, that what lights us up, that what we enjoy matters because this is it. Like this is our only life. And while it's important how we show up for our families and our kids, like that spark within all of us is still so, so important. And I hate to see that extinguished with so many modern moms who just feel really buried right now. So your, your time is diamonds, as Eve would say. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. I think that's a, that's a great way to kind of sum up the episode too. And I think like, again, like your, your passion and goals behind everything, like speak through that quote. So I think that's awesome. Thank you so much, Christo. So nice awesome. to chat with you. Thank yes, you for all the work that awesome. you're doing. I love this. So, and then last but not least, where, again, I know you kind of mentioned it before, but where can everyone find you on Instagram and then any other important links, um, all that, and we can put them in the show notes as well. Yep. You can find us at Totem Women. It's T-O-T-U-M, women, plural, at Totem Women on Instagram. Our site is totemwork.com. That's our new site. And, you know, if you have an employer who could be doing better by working parents, or I say the, the way that you pitch it to them is if they can help their working parents stop spinning their wheels at home so they can be more productive at work, let me know. I would love to help. We have several programs that can help. Awesome. Very cool. Well, thanks again, Erin. It was so awesome talking to you. And thank you so much, Krista. Really see all the work you guys do. All right. It's time for our Mom Tales of the Week, where we reach out to you guys on social media and get your take on motherhood. Different questions each week on Instagram and Facebook and allow you to share your mom confessions, your funny mom stories, and so much more. All right, so this week's question is, if you were stranded on an island with your kids, what are three must-have items you'd want to have with you? Now, lots of people are asking, like, how long am I stranded for? Where am I stranded? What else is on the island? But let's just, you know, be a little creative here. Let's just kind of think, where does your mind first go when you're stranded? I don't know why, but my mind always goes to castaway first. And that is a kind of a scary thought. I think it'd be fun like the first day, maybe like, oh, cool. I'm on an island, but then it'll get kind of scary. So I don't know why my mind always goes to cast away. You might be with me on that. You might think of a different island. So that's what I would go with. All right, here we go. I've got a few different responses here. And again, I always read them for the first time as I'm reading them with you. So it's kind of fun for all of us. All right, first response comes from Sugar Jones. I would bring food, clothes, and a deluxe camping supplies kit. Ooh, I don't know. Is that cheating? I think that's kind of cheating, but we'll go with it. You know, I mean, food for one, 
That's, I mean, how many items is that? That's a lot of, that's a lot of things. You did say three things, but you know, it's a lot. Clothes, one, like one sweatshirt that you guys can all share and cut up and use for different things. Or um, you're talking about a suitcase of clothes, a deluxe camping supplies kit. Now I myself am not a camper. I went to like Girl Scout camp as a kid <laughs> and a few other camps here and there growing up, but I am not, uh, not someone who will find, find enjoyment camping outside. Maybe a camper would be okay. I've done that a couple of times. So what is a camping supplies kit? I'm really curious, but that sounds like a lot of supplies. This sounds like someone that camps a lot. And so she probably knows what to do when in a situation like this. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say, if I am starting on an island, I hope Sugar Jones is there because it sounds like she knows what she's doing. Okay. Next up is anonymous. They say a large tent, fishing pole, and an Ergo Baby 360. Okay. You have thought about all angles. You're, you're thinking about how you're going to catch your food, which is smart. We're going to go, you know, cast away on that. And you're going to have to build a fire, cook it, and a tent. There you, there you go. There's some shelter. Hopefully you don't have a storm like in Castaway, though. There's going to be a lot of Castaway references in this. And I'm really sorry, guys. Next is Anonymous. Clean water. Cheez-Its. And Hot Wheels trucks. I love that you focus on Cheez-Its. You know, you get some get some nourishment because, you know, if you're on an island, you've got probably fish, plants. I mean, and how do you know if a plant's poisonous? You, you don't, you don't. So, and uh, clean water. How long is that going to last? I mean, we're talking a jug here. We're talking a couple jugs and Hot Wheels trucks. You got to keep your kids occupied. But my guess is, most kids could find something to do on an island, you know, run around and got nowhere to go. So, but you know, all right. Number four, anonymous, an iPad, backpack full of snacks and a bottle of wine and who needs a glass? All right. I see where your head's at. The iPad though. I mean, how long is that going to last? Again, my mind's just going to cast away. Hopefully you're not on an island for like a year. I mean, that's a bit drastic. And how's the reception? I mean, I guess you could just use uh, whatever's on your iPad. What's on an iPad without apps or reception? I don't know. Backpack full of snacks. That's almost cheating again. You got, that's, that's like a backpack, a snack, other snacks. That's at least three items. But I like where you're thinking. And a bottle of wine. You know what? You gotta treat yourself, right? We always talk about treating yourself. So you're thinking of you're thinking of your kids, you're thinking of a way to get occupied and your way of treating yourself. So there you go. That's very smart. All right. And last but not least, Arpita Mukherjee, another awesome moderator in our Facebook group. She has said a fully charged mobile phone with service. Okay, Arpita's covering all the bases here. She thought this one out. I like that. Okay, lots of water and snacks for the kids. Okay, so the way Arpita did it was actually very smart because she made it one item by saying fully charged mobile phone with service. That's one item because they're just accessories or parts of the item. Lots of water. That's one item. And snacks for the kids. Technically, snacks would be multiple, but you know what? I, I like the creativity here. I think that's great. And with we can't forget to mention her last comment here, in the hopes that we'll get rescued soon. So she's thinking ahead, but she's also hoping to be rescued. So I thought that was a, that was a cool one. I love those responses. As a reminder, we are posting our question every single Monday on social media. You can find it on Instagram, our Facebook page, and in our Facebook group. We've got all kinds of questions for you to share your funny stories, your mom confessions, your deep stories that you just, you know, kind of want to be vulnerable about and share. So all kinds of things that we're sharing here. I look forward to Mom Tales of the Week every single week. It's a lot of fun. 
So thanks for tuning into this episode and I will see you guys next Wednesday. Hey guys, if you found this or any episode of Mom Talks with Krista helpful, please like, comment, subscribe, and of course, share it with your friends. We release new videos every single Wednesday and our new podcast is out every single Thursday. So lots of different ways you can catch us. And of course, if you're not following us on our socials, go ahead and follow us there. We've got tons of new content for you every single day. And finally, if you're watching this and doubting yourself, you're doing a great job. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next week.